I'm in a city that is one of the most creative in the world. At over 375 years old, it has spent centuries slowly becoming a living, pulsing work of art. The city's originality comes from its overwhelmingly international mix of people, and it's a creativity that stops you in your tracks, can be biked through, and participated in. I'm in Montreal, Canada. I'm Samantha Brown, and I've traveled all over this world. And I'm always looking to find the destinations, the experiences, and most importantly, the people who make us feel like we're really a part of a place. That's why I have a love of travel and why these are my places to love. Whenever I arrive in a big city, it's always helpful to get an overview. So I joined local guide Shay Mayer. He's gonna take me to a hidden part of Montreal that is best revealed on a bike. Why do you think Montreal is such a creative city? It has always been a creative city. Is it because of its immigrant influx? Is it because it's just everyone of the world is here? I think that over time, Montrealers have found their way to kind of appreciate life and celebrate. And the creativity kind of comes out of that. And you'll see it nowadays, like, you know, as you're here, especially in the summer, it's just festival galore. It's like living outside and, and the street art and the painting and the Cirque du Soleil mm -hmm. and, the, and all of the performing arts. Nice. Beautiful day. So let's turn right here and check out a laneway. Okay, right here? Yeah, right here. Oh. So are the laneways all throughout Montreal? All throughout Montreal. So they were originally built as service roads mm -hmm. and there would be coal delivered for heating. Wow ice for the ice boxes, and um, eventually they would do garbage collection and everything in the laneways. Right. A city initiative um, that they wanted to beautify the laneways. And so what would happen is there's certain environmental organizations in each neighborhood would provide financing for groups of residents that would band together and decide to beautify their, their laneway. So this was a city initiative that city. The, the community picked up. Exactly. Wow. So this is one of my favorite laneways. It's called the Ruelle Champêtre. So the bucolic, pastoral, natural laneway. This one's completely closed off to cars. It'll actually be good for us just to get off the bikes and we'll, we'll walk right through. Walk through, okay, yeah. sure. Oh, I mean, I feel like this is just a hidden world. Yeah. Do, do most you know visitors to Montreal even know these exist? I don't think so. And you know we're we're including them more and more on the on the tours that we do, whether it's on on foot or riding bikes, just because it gives you this insider's glimpse, and it's just like such an authentic way to, to visit the city. So this laneway has been essentially a green laneway for about 15 years. 15 years. And because it's completely closed off to cars, all of the residents that essentially live directly on the laneway did have to agree. Um, sign off uh, that it would become oh. a pedestrian laneway. Well, that's a big commitment. It's just these little moments that um, personalize the city more. Mm -hmm. And when you get to go down this lane, you get to be a part of Montreal in a way of life that is very unique. Yep, exactly. So I love uh, riding the laneways and seeing you know groups of neighbors coming together for a glass of wine or a meal, oh. uh, people just crossing over. And so today we're going to go visit a friend named Tinka who lives here in the laneway. You know you're in a French-speaking city when your bike has a place for a bottle of wine, as well as the fact that at any moment, you'll need it. Bonjour! Hello! Hi! How are you? Tinka is having the Montreal version of a summer block party. The atmosphere is breezy and fun, and a way for the neighbors to reinforce the sense of community here that all begins with their laneway. Well, come so, on in. We have lots of neighbors. Excellent. Thank, Thank you. Right Thank now. you. There's lots of kids on this laneway. I know, you guys this is are lucky. Great. Oh, hello, how are you? So, is everyone here live on the laneway? No, yeah, pretty I do. much. Yeah, yeah. I, do. <laughs> I do. Yeah. Yeah. When you move to Montreal and you live here, is this the ideal to live on a laneway and be a part of a type of community like oh, this? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, when you have kids, uh, you know, you know that you can leave your door open and it's going to be safe and they're going to be able to make friends. And this is yeah, it's a big part of. We also have very big trees that we try to take care of, which gives this feeling as well of being. A little bit in, in the, the forest. Country. Absolutely. So, you know, when you are you take your dinner outside on the courtyard and it's 9 
p.m. and you hear the sound of the of the leaves, you really feel like you're in the middle of the of the forest. So you're from the United States. Yes. What do you love about Montreal? I would say the openness of Montreal, the quality of life, mm -hmm. um, the diversity. I'd say that raising children in a bilingual and multicultural environment. Mm -hmm. And I think that for a lot of people, they've come to Montreal looking for something different and mm -hmm. they found it here. And it's the perfect middle ground between Europe. Yes. There's very vibrant European feel, mm -hmm. European culture here in Montreal, with people from Portugal. There's a, a very big Italian community, a big Spanish, French. So it really brings this uh, Mediterranean attitude to food. So how large is Little Italy? How many blocks? Uh, well, you're looking at uh, maybe one, two, three, I don't know, eight blocks. Okay. Eight blocks by eight blocks. Oh, well, that's pretty large. Yeah. And a big part of it is the market. My name is Stefano Faita and I'm a third generation Canadian Italian. When did the Italians immigrate to Canada? In the 1950s was a big the biggest. wave of immigration. I grew up in Montreal's Little Italy in a family business called uh, Dante's. I also own uh, three restaurants in the neighborhood. I'm the third generation trying to lead a family business for another 50 years. Stefan takes me to a market that opened in 1954 and has been run by the same family ever since. Welcome to Milano. Oh, you've taken me to a place I love, a, a market. One of the oldest, if not the oldest, Italian grocery stores in Montreal. We come here because there's things we find from Italy that we probably don't find anywhere else. Even to this day in Montreal. Even to this day. There, there's other, obviously there's other grocery stores that have opened that are, are, you know, have a very big Italian influence, but nothing as renowned as mm -hmm, Milano's. Mm -hmm. My mom literally comes here every day mm -hmm. <laughs> to buy her stuff fresh for the cooking school, maybe a cheese, cold cuts, whatever. They have one of the best cured meats counters. So you see they have even all the, 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 the pickled vegetables, so you know, the olives, the eggplants, the roasted peppers. Uh, yeah, yeah, you have some Italian specialties. Salut. Hi, ça va? On peut tu essayer le prosciutto rulliano? I'm gonna make you taste a really good prosciutto. Please make me taste. Yeah, prosciutto from Parma. Um, oh, yes. It's very, it's fantastic. That's where and it comes from. Yes, right? and it's it's a prosciutto that we serve at the restaurant too because we think it's the best. Mm -hmm. It's fantastic. Uh, there you lovely. go. Thank Merci. You. Oh. Good, huh? Mm. It's not salty. No. It melts in your mouth. Perfect. There's good fat. Mm -hmm. I mean, but right, thin. Thin, nice. thin is always good. For prosciutto, mm -hmm. thin is the best. Mm -hmm. Next up, another institution in Little Italy, Dante's. This is truly the definition of the corner store. Yes, it's actually the first Italian hardware store in Montreal. You think hardware, you're thinking yeah. paint and nuts and bolts and hammers, yes. but they used to sell that. Back in the day, it was more like a general store. Mm -hmm. All kinds of things that from were- made in Italy. Yeah, that were very specific to the Italian community that was, that was immigrating from Italy. Dante's opened in 1956 by the first generation of Stefan's family, and right now working behind the counter is the second generation, his uncle Rudy, as well as his mom, Elena. We sold a lot of hammers and mm -hmm. everything that had to do with construction. So the hardware became kitchenware and houseware. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, one of my uh, eldest uncles that was here first, he was a very big hunting fan. Yes. So, and he knew that the Quebecois were very big hunters and so were the Italian immigrants. Mm -hmm. It was a big pastime for them. So he decided, why don't we start selling guns yes. to go hunting? Yeah. And they started and it just never went away. Okay. Hi Rudy, how are you? Good, very good. He's the one to respect in this store. <laughs> yeah, right? yeah, kind of. <laughs> so, and how many, now too many stores where you can get like a pepper mill and a no, shotgun no, in the you, same place? Exactly. But it goes together. If yeah. You think about it. <laughs> no, because the hunters are very good cooks. Of course, for a chingale. They like to yes. eat both, right? That's right. <laughs> so, who gesticulates more, the French or the Italians? Uh, who loses their hands? The, 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 the Italians. Just, it's about yeah. this, the Italians. I still insane. think it's the Italians. Their, their hands are just a little higher than the French. There's a lot of a mix marriages, so <laughs> it's okay, you okay, know, Italian, exactly. yeah, yeah. Yes. What is that? Yes. That is amazing. Yes. yes. But you know what this me? is for, eh? Dante is known, uh, we're known for oh, like all our canning, restaurant. no, our canning season. What's on the table? What we can, so tomato machines, oh, when okay. we're making marinades, preserves. So this isn't for restaurants, this no, is no, for no, homes. No, this, this is, is for homes. homes. Yeah. This is for the home. So if I'm Italian, 
-huh. What's the one item in this shop that I have to have? A, oh, a pasta Lord. machine. Hand cranked. That's Hand -cranked. my, my biggest seller. That's, your, right. That's what you need, yeah. My customers are 99% Quebecers. That's great. So, you know, it's great. Yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah. It's changed, it's really... you know, even the area. You know, I mean, it, it used to be a very predominantly Italian area. Now, there still are, but a lot of the Italians moved out, either in, in the suburbs or something like that. So, and uh, now we're actually, we're seeing a, a a lot they're of young, young Italian families or young families are coming back with young children. The they're buying a house in the city. Uh, because so they want that, yes. that heritage. They want that, that heritage. Yeah. Yes. It's fun. Yes. They're back to their roots. Mm -hmm. And now, Cafe Italia. Ah. Another family run business. Oh, well, this is great. Sorry. Thank you. How old is this? 1956. So they opened the same year that Dante opened. Everybody comes to Cafe Town. You come, you know, if you come in Little Italy, if it's your first time in Montreal, you're probably gonna stop here and have a coffee. Well, you gotta love the authenticity. It's yeah. not run by hipsters. But no, it's, not, it's, it's old school. It's old school. Family, Terrazzo floor. Luciana, uh, 80 years old, almost 80, still here in the morning. So you come here on a Saturday and it's packed. Uh -huh. Like you can't even move almost, right? Are they and speaking Italian or French? They're speaking Italian and French. Both. You would like one cappuccino? What a great neighborhood you live in. Thank you. It's given a lot back to me. It's genuine. Mm -hmm. And that's what I like about it. Cheers. Cheers. Salut. To Little Italy. To Little Italy. To Montreal. <laughs> Love all. Montreal is a foodie city, and it would be impossible to pick one restaurant to show that. However, there is one place that stands out among the others for its purpose and may represent the heart of the city better than any other. I'm Judy Survey, and I founded and I'm running the Robin du Bois restaurant in Montreal. We're a sociably profitable restaurant on Saint Laurent Boulevard in Quebec. So how it works, we're a non-profit restaurant, but we like to say sociably profitable restaurant. I don't think there's uh, any other restaurant like this one in Montreal, for sure, and maybe even the world. So explain to me Robin Dubois. He's the, he's the guy that took from the rich and gave to the poor. Of course, so Robin this is... Which took me a little while. <laughs> I thought you were Robin Dubois. No, I was like, oh, no. Robin, Robin owns this. Yeah, no, yeah. Robin Dubois yeah, means Robin Hood. Robin Hood. So all the money goes into the same bank account, and at the end of the year, whatever we have in excess, which some years we have, some years we haven't, we give back to four charity organizations that work poverty street level. So there's a whole side of social reinsertion, uh, a lot of young people that want to learn how to work, how to serve, they come here to train. Uh, we have people that are uh, young kids that are out of school that come here on trainings. We have people that need to do community work. I've got quite a bit of restaurant well, experience. Well, that's good for us. Back of the house, I started out washing dishes. Oh, I'm my a God. good cutter, and I've really? waited on tables for eight years in New York wow. City. So, wow. Wow. So you're like, some, the, you're like the most I've got best some volunteer ever. I don't speak French. Is that that's it? all right, because <laughs> you can just say that, you know, Point. you're from out of town. Point. Okay. Point. okay. And okay. you're just from point. out of town. Okay. We have a lot of English customers. Okay. It's all Montreal. Right. It's half and half. Right. So you want to start by the kitchen? Yeah, you want to go the in there? Yeah, okay, absolutely. let's check that out. Follow me. And this is a beautiful restaurant, by the Thank way. You. I love it. It's just cheerful. It's open. So, uh, are you a volunteer here? No. So I'm a I'm an employee. Okay. I started as a volunteer uh, when I like it's been a few years by now. And then I went to cooking school. Then I came here to apply for a job, and I got hired. Was it being so, a volunteer here that inspired you to go to cooking school? Yes. What did you do before? I was working in retail. Working in retail, yeah, very so, different. And this is still customer service, but with, without the direct contact. I like so it. we're still like, this is the hospitality industry. We're right. still helping people, feeding people, and making yeah. people happy. So. so I know that being in the back of a kitchen of a busy restaurant can get very stressful. What is it like dealing with the staff that is? Half volunteer. Once we're in service, if we need like um, some green onions cut very fast, usually we can just ask the volunteers, please can you cut some green onions really, really fast? And yeah. they'll do it, no problem. Yeah, okay. Otherwise, they tend to do more uh, long term prep work. Okay. Yeah. So, Chris, do you need some green onions cut? Because I'm. No, because we've we done some. We just finished doing okay. some. So. <laughs> what can I help you with then? Because I'm, I'm here for the day. Day. Your second day. Yeah, exactly. And and how did you um, find out about this? 
I was just walking around and I saw this. I went in and uh, it's an amazing place where people are like really nice. Uh, they care about you and they want you to feel comfortable. It's an amazing experience. I absolutely love it. And with children, I like during the day, it's, it's wonderful. Right, so I'm, I'm off to a good start. I like this. Good, good, in good hands. <laughs> Hello, yes. bonjour. Yes. How are you today? Here's the yes. menu. There you are. Do you know what you'd like to drink or would you like me to come back? I know what I want. You have a lovely wine list. Nice rosé for a hot summer day. I will take a glass of Pinot Noir. Pinot Noir. And you, sir? And I'll go with the Pilsner one. Pilsner, okay. Merci. What's just that? Just the menu. Asian salad with duck and the Caesar salad with smoked salmon. May I get you anything else? Beautiful. All right. All right. Just enjoy. What I'm eating. Since I was so good at jumping in as a waitress, j'enlève le vin. I thought I would get involved in other ways as well. This time with mixed results. I told everyone freeze. <laughs> Don't worry, this has a happy ending, because I know the man in charge. My name is Anthony Venice, and I like to surprise people in their quotidien, in their daily, daily life. So right now, I've come, at, I've come to Montreal at a really perfect time. This is the, the Montreal Circus Festival, the... Le Montréal Complètement Cirque. Which means the entire city turns into a complete circus. Absolutely. Anthony is a conceptor and director of all things circus here in Montreal. I like to bring circus in the street and reach the people and share my passion that I have uh, with the circus. You were actually born in France. Yeah. And you moved here to Montreal. Yeah, like almost 20 years ago. Actually, I moved here to study at the National Circus School. You so, did? Yeah, yeah, I did. So I was a, an acrobat. I was aerialist. I was doing swinging trapeze. When you go to circus school, what's your favorite class? I'm going to tell you my favorite class was clown. Oh, <laughs> But not just because of about clown, but, but what I like about clown is the creativity. Uh, obviously, you need to be a very creative person to do this. What was it about uh, circus arts that made you want to direct your creativity towards that form of art? It's a good question. I think I really, really like the body language. And I'm always very touched when I see an artist working and giving, um, giving his passion, you know? I think it's very emotional to see someone doing something very uh, risky. You know, because circus, it's all about risk, but it's control risk. What are we about to do right now with you? So me, I'm actually uh, taking uh, taking care of the outside uh, event, mm -hmm. and we'll hold these people behind me. We're gonna run in the street and get in contact with the audience. You want to interact with the audience. Exactly, yeah. Right, and so instead of being a performance that we all sit and watch, right. the audience uh, becomes a so part of go! <laughs> further, we have decided to develop an app. And this technology allows the people, the member of the audience, when they download the app, to be part of the show with us, to play with us. The audience isn't the only one in charge. Using a wireless mic and a smart device, Anthony becomes a ringmaster of the future. So what are you telling them to do now? So now I ask them to do a three high acrobatics. Three high? So, okay. Yeah. Oh my gosh. And again, they're on the street. There's no mat. Whoa! Tap, tap, tap. Hey. 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 Check your phone. Check my phone. Okay. okay. So they're telling everyone to get down and to check their phone. Because everyone who has downloaded the app has the opportunity to control the performers at any given moment. <laughs> Someone just told them to do that. Looks like it's my turn to be the ringleader. So I can say freestyle dance, or tell them to go super slow. There's also a button we could all use on our phones. Oh, I know what I want.
when you come to Montreal, you must see a circus show. Okay, drinks for everybody. And if you still think circus is animal acts, painted clowns, and sawdust, allow me to introduce you to the Seven Fingers, a new type of circus that's not quite held under a big top. This particular show has a limited run, but it's safe to say in Montreal, the circus is always in town. From day to night, there's just no time when this city isn't creative, and night helps illuminate one of the most ambitious public works projects in the world, Cité Memoir, which transforms not only the old city of Montreal, but your own ideas of what art available to all can accomplish. And this is called the Grand Tableau. The Grand Tableau. And this is one of your tableaus, your scenes, that tells the entire history. Of Montreal. Of Montreal. Four centuries. We have to talk about the art and the soul of the city mm -hmm. and, and the human journey, more than political journey. And so uh, it, it, it's an opportunity to, to talk about who we are to the rest of the world. Because usually when you hear about the, the history of a city, it's in the city museum. And yeah. we go inside yeah. Yeah. and we see pictures. And you have used, uh, with the creators, have used the city itself, its physical presence, yeah, it, to tell the history. Walls, abandoned walls. And we don't transform the walls as a screen because we want to see the stone, we want to see the brick. So when you were given this job, this, <laughs> yeah. this task, yeah. what, what was the job description? It was, you know, tell, us, tell the story of Montreal, make a poem. And you share your love, you know, to your uh, to your fellow uh, fellow citizens. And it was, you know, for me a kind of a gift. It's about, you know, the connection between times and now. I mean, this is uh, an epically huge it's art big. installment. The technological challenges of this it's big. were great. So not only the telling of the history, which was your yeah. job, but just mounting it and, and believing that they we and could it, do this. It was. Uh, I think it was just, you know, for the actors. It was. Two months of shooting. How many We're actors? talking 200. 200. It's a, it's a, and uh, 23 scenes in fourth century, different period. You know, tons of costume. You know, for this, the, the, the shooting of every scene. Cité Memoir projects its stories and milestones of Montreal on over 20 buildings. Some stories make you stand motionless. Others are to be walked through and absorbed. This cobblestone alleyway tells the story of the Grey Nuns who accepted abandoned children and cared for unwed mothers. What is it like creating something that no one has ever seen before? <laughs> During the process, we don't think about it. <laughs> we are like that. <laughs> After that, we... we, we it's, you can, you, it's but a now question you've been of, able to step back. Yeah, it's, yeah, I'm proud. I'm proud of it. I'm proud of it, you know. You know. And uh, the, the reaction came from so many people, so you know, it's not just for the artist community. Of course, it's, it's for everyone. Montreal is a very open-minded community and there is a lot of festival going on. It's very di diversified. Basically, it's a recipe. My nonna's minestrone, right? So you get a few Italians, you get a few Greeks, two, three Portuguese, a pinch of Chinese, some uh, French stock, because huh? Quebecois were yeah, French stock. Simmer all that together and you probably get the best recipe you ever had. And I think that when you feel that, that you're, you're sharing something in a community, you, you, it makes you stronger. It makes every individual stronger, and it makes the community stronger. And I think that's what Montreal is about, definitely. Soupe de Montréal. When old buildings shed new light on how we learn from the past. When urban back roads give us a glimpse of a more personal side. <laughs> when you fall in love with a city, and it hugs you back. <laughs> that is when we share a love of travel. And that's why Montreal, Canada is a place to love. <laughs>